Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for August 26, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is integrity protection for scientific workflow data, motivation, and initial experiences with Anurban Mandal and Mats Ringe. Um, Anurban is the Assistant Director for Network Research and Infrastructure at Renaissance Computing Institute, and Mats is a Computer Scientist for Science Automation Technologies at USC, uh, it, pardon, the USC Information Sciences Institute. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. I will be following it during the presentation, but we should also have time at the end of the presentation for questions as well. And with that, I will hand things over to Mats. Mats, welcome. Yes, thank you. So let me share my screen and present here. Okay, so yeah, thank you for having us. So, so my name is Mats Rinsch, uh, Anna Barn is with us as well, and we're going to switch off between us a, a couple of times here during the presentation. And, and what we're presenting here is, uh, uh, it's really a paper that we had published at PERC 19. Uh, we presented that about a month ago. And so this slide set here is, is very similar to that. That's, you know, I'm listing all the co-authors, for example, in the paper here in this slide. Um, so the paper is also available, obviously, if you want want more details about what we're presenting. Well, and Mats, you also won an award for that, right? Yes, we did. We <laughs> actually won two awards. We got um, uh, best track uh, in uh, what was the track? It's the software and applications track, and the second award was the Phil Andrews Award, which is uh, a, a you know a perk award for uh, best of best almost. So, and we, we shared that with, with another, we had a tie, uh, so we shared that award. But yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, uh, a great experience. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. So, um, let me just set the stage here and, and explain why data integrity is something that we find uh, important. And one of the products that we work on is the, the Pegasus Workflow Management System. And this is um, a production uh, workflow system uh, used by a, a, a large number of users. And uh, I pulled stats for the last 12 months where we had about 240,000 workflows and 145 million jobs. But one of the things that sets us apart from other workflow systems is that we are focusing on distributed computing. And what that means is that the majority of those 145 million jobs had data transfers associated with them. That means that we transfer data to the jobs and, 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 and from the jobs. And uh, so obviously these, these, uh, th this number of, of data transfers, you know, we want to ensure that, that, the, that the data that we are uh, computing on is, uh, is uh, what, what we expect it to be. And also, these transfers are, um, many of them are on a local area, uh, local, uh, area network, but there's a bunch of them that's also on uh, distributed systems like the Open Science Grid, where we do over wide area networks or, or even internationally. So keep those, those things in mind uh, as we keep on talking about integrity and, 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 and the context there for, uh, for the rest of this talk. Now, um, the work itself, it was uh, conducted under a uh, 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 NSF funded project called the SWIP, the Scientific Work for Integrity with Pegasus project. And uh, this project is ending. We actually have our last uh, meeting uh, later on today. And so uh, it's also a very nice to be able to present the work here as a kind of a, uh, a finishing touch of this project. Um, but we also, as Anna Barn is going to talk about is that there's a follow on project that, that takes this uh, uh, even even further, and he will explain more about that later. The SWIFT product, though, was the, 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 the goal here was to uh, add, add an additional assurance uh, on scientific workflow uh, data. And that data is, is 
both during a workflow execution, right, from start to finish, but also after the workflow is done. So you can go back and, and, and later on say, the data that you know, I produced a while back, is that still um, uh, correct? All right, and the outline of this talk is that we're going to first going to talk a little bit about the introduction and motivations for this work. We talk about the approach and current status, and we're going to talk about uh, how we tested our implementation and, and how we exercised that, and that's the jungle part. We're going to talk a little bit about integrity issues that we found in production workflows, and then about future work. And before I get really deep into this, also let's define what I mean with data integrity, right? So in this project, we are interested in data integrity to the lowest level, right? We're talking about bit flips, for example, where a single bit is something we want to be able to detect and handle uh, accordingly. So, um, so that's the level we're working with. And the challenges to this this integrity is that uh, well, there's many many reasons why it's not a, a perfect world. Um, one is that the systems that we're using, uh, even though they have multiple levels of of um, of integrity assurances, um, they're not perfect. Right? We see bugs in software and 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 implementations, uh, hardware errors, memory errors, disk errors. So there is both the hardware and software component to it. We also see uh, things like protocols like TCP that was designed when data sizes were smaller and packet sizes were smaller. And they were def designed with a certain size checksum that is maybe not uh, uh, appropriate today when, when our data sizes and packet sizes are getting bigger and bigger. And there's also the, the, the malicious uh, attacker problem. And even though we, we covered that in SWIP, we're not actually talking a lot about it, it, it in this, this talk here. Um, malicious attackers, though, like the, 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 the data integrity issues that, that comes out of that would still be covered by this implementation that we have. It's just not that we're talking specifically about it. And the last thing I want to point out, though, also is that there's a user perception problem. And that is that um, many of the users that we work with, I mean, they're not computer scientists. And when when they hear things about, uh, you know, we have RAID and the ratio group protection and checksumming and like, it's easy to become, um, uh, like to feel that, that you're well protected using the systems that are available to you. And uh, maybe the takeaway from this talk is that you are not as well protected as you think you are. There are gaps in this, these technologies and, and uh, could be um, uh, bugs even with all these implementations, right? So I have a few examples here of, of, of uh, where things can go wrong. Um, one, uh, one motivation here is uh, hardware, where we talk about disk, uh, disk and disk subsystem problems. So there's two studies that we are uh, referring to. One is from CERN and one is from NEC, where they looked at the RAID 5 and uh, hard drives. So CERN, uh, the conclusion of both of the studies are, are basically the same, but, but the CERN one uh, was talking a bit more specific about the RAID 5 and how um, there are uh, error rates that 10 to negative seven level. Um, and uh, the NEC study found that one in 90 SATA drives will experience uh, data corruption. And not only data corruption, but silent data corruption, right? Because, which is making the problem even worse. Because if you knew that there was a, a problem with your data, uh, you could you know, take action. The silent data corruption problem means that you, know, you don't know until, until you know, maybe it's too late. Uh, another uh, problem that we have uh, is with network corruption when the data is in transit. So in this case, we can have things like uh, we saw an exceed in Internet 2 network in 2013, where there was um, switches in between exceed sites that uh, silently um, um, uh, corrupted packages. And it was a really low level, right? It was a 0.001% of the packages being being corrupted. 
but which sounds really low, but you also have to remember the amount of data that we ship between these sites, right? These are some big data sets being sh shipped back and forth. So even a lower rate like that could, could actually have a big impact. And in, for Pegasus, we saw a similar case in 2017 where, uh, where we had a, a, a workflow running at the University of Chicago. And um, what's interesting about this one is that uh, we were asked to validate a new version of this workflow. And the user ran the workflow, we went in, we looked at it and we said, hey, you know, the workflow finished fine, data came back, everything looks great. And we signed off on this uh, as, as uh, uh, this new version. And it wasn't until the user started looking at the data and it happened to be tar GC files. So GZIP started complaining that it couldn't unzip the files because they were corrupted. And it turns out that, uh, sure enough, they, they were corrupted and there was a bad cable combined with um, um, uh, bad network firmware, a bug in the network firmware uh, that, um, uh, that allowed this, these packages to be corrupt. And we could reproduce this very easily once we knew what to look for. And the last uh, um, problem that we see is software bugs. And this is, you know, we all know that there's no, th no such thing as a, as a perfect piece of software, bug-free piece of software. And um, so here's one example of that is that one of the transfer protocols that we, we use in Open Science Grid called Stash Cache. Um, and, and to be fair, this was in the beta version of Stash Cache. But uh, there was a, a, a bug in there where, where it uh, returned a faulty error, uh, exit code. It said it had a, a zero exit code in, uh, even though it had failures. And in one of our workflows, what happened was that it failed at the perfect place or the, the, the worst place at the end of the workflow where uh, we had the final data being staged back. And uh, so Pegasus did a transfer, it looked okay, and, and Pegasus cleaned up all the intermediate data products. Well, the problem was that that last transfer had never happened correctly, it was corrupt. And while we cleaned up all the, the intermediate data files, well, we lost about the 10 years of, of core hours of, of this one, one little bug. And this is something that happens you know, more frequently than, than, than not, that there are, uh, uh, bugs in the software. And we have another example later on in the production uh, integrity problem section. There's also the question, how is this an integrity issue, right? And you have to think about the, 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 what the users expects from the workflow system to see that maybe that the, the, the user have delegated data management to the workflow system. So the workflow system has to provide that assurance back to the user and, and uh, protecting from, from, from bugs and, and, and from data integrity issues. Yeah, that's, that's one of the jobs of the, of the, the workflow system. So let's look at what we did about this, what our approach was. And it's, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, we ended up um, 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 adding functionality to Pegasus to generate checksums when we produce data and validate checksums when we, um, when we use data. And um, this is a pretty good fit because, so Pegasus is one of these workflows that, that plans out the, the workflow execution in full before starting execution. So we know where all the data is uh, produced and used. So placing these checksums, well, it's a little bit of, of, of uh, you know, graph manipulation, right? Like to insert and, 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 and add, uh, add those, those tasks. But, um, and the placement is important, right? Because we want to make sure that we, we validate at the right place and we generate at the right place. But it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty good fit for, for our workflow system to, um, to do this, this, uh, this work. And this, the checksums that we're using, we do have support for, for, uh, for other ones, uh, or they can add support for other ones, I should say. The main one we're using is SHA-256. And uh, the reason we picked this is that, uh, that it's you know, a well-regarded uh, uh, algorithm that, that, that used in, 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 in a lot of, of places. 
So um, we had one of the concerns that we did when we picked SHA-256 was if it was going to be too slow. Um, but we're going to show you later on that it, it doesn't really have the impact on, on, the, on the workflow uh, runtimes. Uh, we also did look at some uh, or considered to use something more complex where instead of just being a binary yes or no, this file has uh, passes integrity or not, uh, we wanted to maybe have something that could pinpoint or give us uh, uh, some kind of evaluation of how big of a, of a mismatch the file would have with, um, with the expected um, checksum. We haven't really found a good tool like that, so that's why we're sticking with SHA-256. Okay, uh, so what's the current status here? Well, we have, uh, in October last year, we released Pegasus 4.9.0, and this is the first release that had integrity validation built in. And one of the things I want to point out, though, is that we opted to make uh, the, the integrity implementation the default. So this is it's on by default. You can opt out if you want to. But the reason for doing this, the reason for adding it as um, on by default, right, is that um, going back to those 240,000 workflows we ran last year, by, by adding this in as a default, people upgrading now uh, from, from whatever previous version they had to 4.9 uh, will get this protection automatically, right? So uh, the impact here can be pretty big. We, uh, our user base, I think we are about 60% upgraded already, maybe 70. So, um, so there's a lot of users that already just get this, this uh, implementation for free. Now, so while the protection is, is on by default, one of the things that's not on by default is that the extended um, monitoring data sharing with the Pegasus team. And this is the data that we would need to be able to tell, uh, you know, across all users what the, <clears throat> what the actual impact was. Like we would, uh, if, if everybody had this sharing turn on, we would be able to tell you exactly how many integrity problems we've seen across all our whole user base. Um, but we can't do this because of, for example, privacy issues, right? We, we, um, we only collect very, very anonymized data by default, and this, uh, uh, by definition, would not be anonymized. So, so that's why this is off by default. However, we have a few users that we have convinced to <coughs> um, uh, opt in on this and share it with us. So we do have uh, some of the data that we can show you a little later here. Uh, we have a question that came in. Yeah, go ahead. And I think it's for the previous slide. Uh, oh. Is there concern using SHA-256 since it's not considered a secure hash? So SHA-256 is considered to be a secure hash. Uh, the SHA-1 and, 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 and those uh, previous ones are not secure. However, you also have to remember that, um, I mean, we're not, this is not for passwords, for example, where a lot of these hashes come up where you're saying, hey, it's not, it's not perfect. Uh, in, in the scientific community, a lot of people are using even weaker hashes uh, for example, um, I can't remember what's called, um, but they're using weaker ones because they want to have a, a quick, uh, also Adler 32, for example, they want to have a really quick uh, hashing function to, to, um, 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 to make sure that it doesn't have an impact on the, on the computation. So SHA-256 is a good balance. It's, it's, uh, it's well regarded and it's, it's uh, you know, uh, accurate enough for, for what we're doing with it. I hope that that answers the question. And if not, we can, we can come back to it and, and have, have a more detailed discussion later. Um, so we're we going. So, okay, so we'll come back to that later. Um, I'm not going to talk in super detail on, on how we actually implemented this, but on, there's two things I want to point out on this slide. And one is up here in the right top corner where we have <coughs> uh, zoomed in, like that little looking glass is looking at one Pegasus job on this one per worker node. And it, 
even the job itself starts looking a little bit like a workflow now where it has multiple steps. Uh, it creates a, a, a directory, it states your state in, and then uh, those two dots that are shaded like some kind of pink or purple, those are the integrity uh, checks and validation. So what I want to point out here is that if you look at T1, just before we're running that, that user task, the, you know, right before that is where we check the integrity of the, the data. And right after that task is done, that's when we generate the, <coughs> the checksums. So the placement here is important, right? We want to have those as close to the task as possible just to minimize the gap there, right? And that's what we have done here. They are placed uh, as close as we can to, to those, uh, uh, the data use and the data uh, produced uh, by that task. The other thing I want to point out is what happens if we encounter a job failure? And if you counter an integrity failure. <clears throat> so let's say that uh, on that job on the top right there where we failed just before the task. And what happens is that the job fails. It gets marked as a failure. It, uh, the job stops and uh, Pegasus will uh, handle it just like any other job failure. And in most cases, that is uh, <clears throat> a combination of retry. So the job will, uh, will you know, start over somewhere else. And if in the case of uh, uh, um, like a, a intermittent problem, you know, there's a good chance that that job retry will will just fix it, to fix the problem, right? It will will happen the first time, but not the second time. So that's a, a one way that that the, the, the workflow will try to make progress, even in case of integrity failures. If the if the job keeps on having integrity issues, if there's for maybe a source file that a source input that um, uh, that's the problem, and there's no way we can make any more progress, the workflow will stop and and uh, alert the user that 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 they encountered this error and, and it can't make any more progress. The user can then either fix the issue and then restart the workflow or, or you know, uh, handle the, the, the integrity issue uh, at the source. So the, what we've described here, right, is like an implementation that, um, um, that um, handle, like to find these integrity errors are, it's a really rare events. So the problem is we're trying to implement something that finding needles in a haystack. And um, to even for testing this is becoming difficult, right? Because if you run this through our normal testing system, the events would be so rare that we would never know for sure if we had even found any or if we had found them, if they were um, real events or not. So, uh, the question is, how can we, um, you know, test this in a better way, right? Like if we, uh, if there's no integrity problem, uh, did we just fail to detect it? Or if there was an integrity error, was it uh, a real one that, that, that we handled correctly? So testing here is important. And, and Pegasus by, you know, before SWIP came around, um, we, um, we used heavily um, uh, Atlassian products. So we used Bamboo for, for nightly tests and, and, and builds. And the way that that works is that when you shake something in, <clears throat> there's an automatically build, an automatic run of the unit tests. And nightly we ran functional tests, which is a bunch of workflows, about 85 or so workflows per branch. So we had a, a, a high confidence in, in the test coverage but again, the, these events that we're talking about would be so rare that we would probably would never ever see them in Bamboo. So we needed something better and that's what Annabarn is going to talk about. So I'm going to stop sharing here and hand it over to Annabarn. All right, thanks Mats. Uh, let me share the slides. And can you just get a little closer to your microphone again? Yeah, sure. Thank you. All right, can you see my screen? All right, so um, 
as Maud said, that in addition to testing using the bamboo framework, uh, which pretty much checks um, whether the integrated checking code is working as expected from, a, from an implementation perspective, we want to test whether the Pegasus integrated protection uh, is working under faulty infrastructure conditions. Right, so we want to uh, find out if the, uh, if the integrity errors are detected under infrastructure that corrupts data intentionally and to check whether Pegasus is able to detect those integrity errors and uh, uh, preferably move past the integrity errors uh, with the workflow succeeding. So to do that, we developed a tool called the Chaos Jungle, uh, which is inspired by, by the Netflix Chaos Monkey Toolkit. And uh, if you know about Chaos Monkey, uh, it's, a, it's a resiliency tool that randomly terminates VMs and containers, and it helps uh, the Netflix engineers to test their applications and software under, uh, uh, under faulty VM instance uh, uh, deletions, right? So it, it, uh, the engineers launch their applications, and at the back, someone just topples over the VMs and the containers and they check whether the applications are resilient and, and they're, they're tolerant against those failures. So similarly, uh, we had developed uh, this Chaos Jungle Toolkit uh, where uh, the goal is to introduce different kinds of impairments uh, into a virtual infrastructure. It might be network, computer storage, instance, instantiated on a testbed like uh, like Genie or ExoGenie, where the Chaos Jungle software introduces impairments into different data operations. So it can corrupt data on the disk. It can corrupt data in transit um, uh, for the network transfers and, and so forth, right? So what I'm going to describe in the following slides is mostly the mode for Chaos Jungle where it, uh, uh, it intentionally corrupts data for, for the data transfers. And data transfers, as you, as Maud said, is one of the uh, interesting use cases for distributed workflows. And many a time uh, from our testing and from, from previous use cases, we have seen that uh, errors, integrity errors, do, do creep up for, for wide data transfers. So we wanted to check uh, whether Pegasus um, is able to detect those integrity errors under conditions where Infrastructure, uh, infrastructure basically predictably uh, corrupts the data underneath. So, so Chaos Jungle, the, the network part of Chaos Jungle, uh, it uses uh, something called an extended Berkeley packet filter functionality, uh, where a small, it's called eBPF, uh, so a small eBPF uh, program is injected into a kernel on the receiving side of a, of a packet. So imagine a, a, a worker node that's trying to run your competition and is trying to get data from somewhere else. And we inject, uh, the, we inject the Chaos Jungle tool in the kernel of the receiving side. And uh, we attach it uh, using the traffic control filter, which is called TC or HTTP. And what it does is it inspects the packets received and modifies some of the packets so that uh, the checksums are, are, um, are still the same, but it actually swaps some of the packets so that the, the actual data is invalid. So the checksum is preserved, but, but, uh, but the packets contain invalid data on the receiving end. So that's a mechanism that we use to, to corrupt data transfers underneath in the infrastructure, right? And we see that uh, our Chaos Jungle uh, tool is pretty fast and performant, and the, the graph here shows that it has very low overheads, about one to three, three point five percent overhead uh, for for higher bandwidths. So this is a tool that's available on GitHub, and uh, people can test their software uh, uh, using uh, using faulty transfers uh, using Chaos Jungle. So what? So in the context of of the of the Swift project, uh, we wanted to do a do an experimental setup. Where we, where we tested Pegasus integrity checking uh, with Chaos Jungle. Uh, so what we did was we set up a virtual infrastructure, uh, uh, mainly a Condor environment where we have 
a set of condor workers which which run the jobs in the workflow. And we have a, a different data node on a different site on the testbed, which hosts the data for the workflow. And then we have another VM, which is the Condor master and where, where all the Pegasus software is running uh, with the integrity checking. And we, uh, we first we deploy the Chaos Jungle scripts on the worker nodes so that those scripts can mangle the packets coming from the, from the data node as soon as they try to fetch the data for, for, for doing the computation on the data. So that's step zero. Step one, we launch the workflow with Pegasus Integrity Checking Enable. And then uh, during the workflow execution, uh, when the workflow data is fetched from the, uh, from the data node, Chaos Jungle automatically mangles the packets, uh, makes the data corrupt. And it, now we can check whether Pegasus is, able, is first is able to detect those errors. And second, whether it can move past those errors, right? And then uh, as Mod said that, uh, that the, the, this Pegasus version sends monitoring data about integrity errors uh, uh, to uh, back to Pegasus if users opt into that. And you can see as a user whether your workflow is encountering integrity failures, failures and whether, um, whether the Pegasus is able to move past those errors or not. So that's the dashboard on the top. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details of these views of the dashboard because Mox is going to show a demo of this at the end of the talk. Um, so this basically shows how many jobs are run by, uh, by the workflows, how many jobs are succeeding, and how many jobs are failing, and if they're failing, if, 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 if it was encountering integrity failures. Uh, so we ran a bunch of experiments with, uh, with Chaos Jungle turned on uh, with uh, with with the uh, with the production workflow, we modified the workflow so that it doesn't take as as, as uh, uh, very long. Um, but it's a production workflow uh, that's uh, that that comes out of Clemson. It's called the OSG Kink workflow. It has about 50, it has about fifty thousand jobs, and we ran the workflow under different conditions. So each point on the x-axis basically says the the chaos jungle error rate, rate meaning. Uh, how many packets out of 10,000 packets were, uh, were mangled as a part of Chaos Jungle. So as you go to the right of each of these graphs, you have um, increasing error rates for Chaos Jungle. So we ran it under these different conditions where first we ran it without any integrity checking uh, uh, turned on in Pegasus, just the vanilla version. And the second, uh, the second bar is basically uh, running with Pegasus with integrity checking enabled, but not, but but without any Chaos Jungle enabled. And then the the next four bars are these different levels of in errors for Chaos Jungle, meaning one out of ten thousand packets were uh, were mangled. The next one is one out of five thousand packets were mangled, and so forth. Right. So, and we ran multiple workflows for each of these cases. And interestingly, what we see is, um, is uh, Pegasus is detecting uh, integrity errors for all cases, but it's able to recover from those integrity errors only until the error rate of one, one out of 10,000 packets. Uh, the breakover case is about one in 5,000 packets where some of the workflows are still are still succeeding, whereas, whereas workflows start failing. And if, if the failure rate is increased beyond that, uh, most of the workflows, uh, all the workflows are failing. The, that's the left graph. And the right graph basically shows the view of, uh, from a job specific view, where uh, the X axis is the same set of uh, experiments. And we see that from about uh, one out of 5,000 packets rate, uh, jobs started failing so that the workflow started failing, right? So uh, the, the takeaway point is we observed that um, at an error rate of one out of, of 5,000 packets, um, that's where st things start failing. Now, uh, as Mods mentioned, that Pegasus has this job retry, um, uh, job retry capability uh, where uh, you can retry a job if a job, if a job has failed. So we added one more access uh, to the um, 
uh, to the experiments where we increase the number of job retries and try to see whether by increasing the job retries, workflows can be made, more workflows can finish successfully or not. And lo and behold, yeah, that, that's, that's true. We can see that uh, if we increase the job retries, the workflow success percentage actually, uh, actually incre in increases, right? So, uh, so there are these two different knobs and uh, we saw that Pegasus is able to detect the error in most cases and in many cases it can move past integrity errors. Uh, we have a question that came in real quick. Yeah. Sure. Are there specific step steps within this workflow that are more sensitive to bad data and contribute more to the total failure of a workflow? Um, I, I can answer that one. In, in this workflow, no, because there is, um, I mean, these are, it, it's really just a, a large set of, of uh, uh, very similar jobs. So, so so in this case, no. We have looked at that, and there's actually another paper where we're trying to set um, importance, uh, like assign an importance score to different jobs based on on how important they are data-wise in the workflow. The, like that works to a certain degree, right? You can look at, for example, like fan in and fan out of the nodes in the graph, but you can't really, you know, know what the user, like the importance of the data to the user. So I think that's that's one of the things where it's still kind of a, a researchy component of this. Um, but as I said, in this case, no, they're all equally important. Okay, hope that answers the question. Um, going forward, um, we so could you? Uh, I'm sorry. Could you uh, step uh, put the microphone a little closer to your face? Sorry, that's okay. So, um, so we tested the workflows with Pegasus integrity checking on the test bed infrastructure, right? And we saw that it could uh, it could recover for failures. It could detect the integrity errors. We then went went ahead and and released uh, Pegasus version, as Mark said, and we had um, we had production workflows opt into this integrity checking feature, and we uh, we we ran a bunch of these production workflows. But most of the users actually ran them, and and these are workflows which are really large workflows with data transfers, many of them wide area data transfers, and many of them might not have uh, protected protocols like SSL, so they might be just using, using HTTP for transfers. So, and, and we are of course collecting data on an opt-in basis, and we, are, uh, we wanted to check whether these, these integrity errors do happen in the real world or not, right? Um, whether it's a needle in a haystack or not, so it's, it was a learning experience for us throughout the project. And when you ran the same workflow uh, that I described before, the OSJ King workflow, uh, with integrity checking on, uh, we found out very soon, uh, very early on, uh, that there were about 60 integrity errors that, were, uh, that, uh, that happened when this workflow was run, right? Uh, fortunately, though, for all those errors, the, the, the the problematic jobs were retried, automatically retried by Pegasus, and the workflows finished successfully. So that so the scientists and the the scientists were fine, the results were fine. But when we did when we dug into those sixty errors, we found out that um, those three errors happened on three different hosts. And um, this was error analysis that was done by hand by digging through the logs. Uh, we found out that one was an input file error in in Osset, Colorado. Then there were three input file, uh, input file mo mostly those were the executable uh, files. Uh, there was an error in, a, in, a, in one single node uh, at uh, University of Nebraska. And then there were the, the rest of the 56 errors uh, were on different compute nodes on the same side. So we suspect that, uh, that, the, that the three errors for the, for the executable type of errors um, were because of node level caches getting corrupted, whereas the bulk of the 56 errors were maybe the site level cache was corrupted. So, so we, uh, so 
So this is error analysis done by hand, and this is our best suspicion on why it happened. But um, as we said, Pegasus retried the jobs and workflow finished successfully. We have also been seeing uh, a steady stream of integrity errors for another workflow called the Veritas workflow, where uh, it happens in a pattern and one about the 2,500 transfers, uh, they, uh, they uh, encounter integrity failures. And we don't know the cause of this. Uh, the workflows are running fine because of the retries. But uh, as we realized that uh, detection is easy, but diagnosis of why it happened is, is much more difficult, right? So then in this case, we suspect that there, are error, there might be errors in HTTP-based transfers that, that this very does workflow does, um, might be in the S3 protocol against SAP. So, so these errors are happening in the wild and, and uh, the Pegasus integrity checking is, is really helping scientists uh, to move past those errors. Uh, so one of the things that we also did was to check uh, the overheads of our integrity checking uh, uh, modules in Pegasus. So we, we instrumented Pegasus to find out overheads for both generation of the checksums and, and, uh, and also for comparison of the checksums. And we see that the overheads are really low. Even for the 1,000 node OS checking workflow, the overhead is about 0.05 percentage. Uh, a 5,000 job workflow had overhead of 0.06%. So it's really negligible. So uh, uh, even if it's an opt, uh, it's an opt out option, people should not opt out of this uh, because of overheads. Our our results show that. Um, so going forward, as we, uh, what are the challenges uh, that we uh, that we discovered as a part of part of SWIT and what are what are we doing going forward? Um, so as I said, detecting an error is easy, right? But it's very difficult to find out what actually caused the error. Um, then how do we balance um, the performance um, of uh, the basically the integrity checking and and the performance of the application itself, right? Uh, what happens if uh, if we have uh, uh, if we hit the limits of of the different cryptographic algorithms? So there's many other challenges that 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 are still left uh, in this area. And one of the things that we're doing going forward is we have a follow-on project um, called Iris, which is integrity introspection for scientific workflows. Uh, we have the same partners here. Renzi, uh, USCISI, the Pegasus team, and Von Welch team at IU. So whereas SWIP addresses integrity checking, make sure, making sure that workflow computations are protected from integrity errors, but it doesn't address the analysis of the integrity errors discovered, right? Uh, so it doesn't trace the source of error or does any root cause analysis to remedy the problem. So the goal of the IRIS project is to, is to detect, diagnose, and pinpoint the source of unintentional integrity errors in work executions. And so, uh, so we have started work, uh, work on this project and uh, the, the approach is uh, we will develop this uh, unintentional integrity threat models uh, and, and inject those uh, in, a, in a test based scenario. We'll extend the Chaos Jungle software to to be seeded with those uh, threat models, and we'll use uh, we'll train those models um, uh, with data collected on the test bed and build the machine learning models on the, on the test bed scenario, uh, and then we'll apply those machine learning models on uh, on production side infrastructure to check whether uh, they can actually help us. Do a root cause analysis of the of the of the integrity errors, and we are we are exploring different kinds of machine learning approaches, both uh, both at the batch layer and the speed layer, meaning doing an offline analysis and maybe also doing an online analysis. So this is work in progress, and hopefully we'll report something about this at supercomputing close of 2019. But uh, this is where we're going forward.
So um, I'll now uh, transition to, to the demo bots. Um, I'll stop sharing. Um, uh, while Mats is uh, pulling that up, we got a question here. If Chaos Jungle is introducing errors that do not affect checksums, how do the checksums in Pegasus detect these errors? If Chaos Jungle is um, introducing errors that do not affect checksums, right? So Pegasus detects uh, integrity errors no matter what, right? So if something, uh, it it acts at the file level, correct, Mark? So no matter how the file got corrupted, Pegasus will still be able to detect the integrity errors. Okay, so this is just a way to, to inject errors in the infrastructure. The network error is just a part of it, right? Does that answer the question? Uh, we're waiting for a reply. Okay. Uh, Yes, he says, yeah. thanks. Uh, another follow-up question. TCP has pretty good error checking. So are injected quote unquote bad packets revealing failures in TCP checking or sending software's handling of valid TCP error reports. So. Um, okay, so I get it. So the question is, so are injected bad packets revealing failures in TCP checking or sending software's handling of valid TCP error reports? Okay, so basically this, um, this happens a little bit at a lower level here. Um, you know, even, even before, uh, before it goes up the stack in the TCP, uh, uh, in the TCP stack, it, it basically, as soon as the SK buff um, data structure is created, we have the traffic control hook to, to, to just swap the packets, right? So the, so the checksums are, are, are still preserved. So the data is invalid. Now the question is whether there's a higher level checking that can detect it or not, right? And you know, SSL and other, you know, if, if, if we had used SCP in the experiments, we would not have gotten the errors, right? So uh, higher level checking can, uh, can and in many cases, does the does check against these corruptions, but we are basically testing using a corner case where those are not checked uh, in say the pure HTTP transfers. So, so Mark, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so I mean, the, the point with the chaos jungle is, is to mimic the case that we were talking about that happened at UChicago with the, with the faulty network switches, right? And what happened in that case is that, that the bad network cable and the, the the bad uh, store forward algorithm that they had uh, uh, ended up corrupting the package in such a way that they were not detectable by the TCP checksums, right? And that's what we that's why we need to do um, uh, the chaos jungle is a kernel module where you know allows us to mess with the packages without triggering TCP checksum um, problems. And we got another follow-up question here. Is it conceivable that accumulated packet errors could result in a file whose checksum does not change? Has that been tested? Yeah, and, and there is a reference, like if, in this paper, there's a reference to that. that there's somebody did a calculation about, uh, about the, the size of the TCP checksum, which again, I, I, you know, this is outside my field of expertise, but basically it is, um, the checksum is small enough that uh, with jumbo frames and uh, the amount of data that we're shipping around, uh, you know, you could actually end up with um, uh, a problematic package having the, the correct checksum. And it's obviously the, the, the rate of that is really low, but it could happen. And, and I, I will refer to that, that reference in that paper to, to that. So, um, you know, we, if, if you can't find the, the, the reference, email me and I'll, I'll dig it up for you. And then uh, just uh, going back to the previous uh, person who asked the question, uh, uh, they, they responded, ah, so MTU reframing in switches can result in bad packets with good checksums. 
again, I will, I will, <laughs> I will refer to to the paper in that one as well. Uh, the, the problem we had at U Chicago, and I'll, I'll just say that, like, kind of in a general reference here, is that a vendor was deploying a new, uh, uh, um, like, their latest, greatest uh, switches, uh, right? And they weren't super willing on telling us details on what went wrong. But as far as we can tell, um, it was the bad network cable that actually introduced errors. But because this was a 100 gigabit network, I think, um, they ended up having a, a pass through between the switches, uh, which did not check the checksums. And it generated a checksum at the end which which was too late for 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 the error. So it it was it was the combination of pass through and the storm forward at the end that 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 introduced the error. But the vendor wouldn't give us exact details on what went wrong. Uh, okay, let's let's go ahead and move forward with the uh, demo. Yeah. So this is just a. a, a um, a kind of a view of what we're seeing when we have people opt into the data collection. And and I have a, a few asterisks here. One is, uh, this is a moving target. We know with Iris, uh, this is going to change again. We are changing a little bit on what data we're collecting in Pegasus and how we're collecting it. So this, this dashboard I'm showing here is, uh, uh, you know, it, it's going to change fairly soon here again. But it gives you a good idea of, of, of how we are uh, viewing this data. And the data, it goes from um, the submit host where the, pay, the workflow is running, and it goes in via a, a message passing system into Elasticsearch. So all the data lives in Elasticsearch. And what you're seeing here on my screen, and I hope you can see it, right? I'm sharing my screen. Yeah. Yep, we can see it. Uh, yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay. So what you're seeing is a, a Grafana dashboard. And if you've never seen Grafana before, the way that this works is uh, up here on the right corner, you can can pick a time frame that you're interested in. So in this case, I've picked the last six months. So the data we're seeing here further down is all, you know, minus six months to now. And uh, we also have a few filters where we can change the binning size. We can change what submit host are we interested in, what users we're interested in. Um, the next row is a summary row where we're saying how many users, how many workflows, how many jobs, job failures, integrity failures, and cumulative work wall time. And again, this is for those six months. So if I pick a different times, time series here, like last 30 days, you know, everything will update and show me what, what that data looks like. So let's go back to six months again. Um, and then we have a few graphs. We have uh, number, like the number of jobs finishing over time. Uh, this is the top 50 workflows at that, that given time. Again, when there's a lot of them running sometimes, so we have to filter it down somehow. Average job duration, it's not really important for this, but we use the dashboard for other things. And, and in those cases, maybe the average job duration is interesting. Um, the next two here is the job success and failures. So um, obviously we, uh, we want to see more success than failures. But one way of looking at this is that when we have failures here, uh, those failures can be categorized into different things. Like it could be a user, like a code problem or an infrastructure problem, or it could be an integrity issue. So we've broken out the integrity issues into its own um, uh, graph as well. And looking at this here, you see a lot of integrity issues. And the reason for that is that in this case, um, we are including errors from our nightly build and test system. So that's the bamboo that I had a slide on earlier. So what we can do is we can go up and we can um, um, exclude the bamboo host and just do everything else. And again, these are just the users that opted in and for this particular Pegasus version. All right, so what happens is uh, now it looks a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, production uh, uh, ready here, right? Where we had <clears throat> 357,000 jobs and we have 30 integrity errors. And that's uh, on par with what we saw in the paper. 
um, if we are interested in seeing where this happened, right? Like most of the time we are, we want to be able to see and say, what user, what workflow, and what was the infrastructure ran on? And one way of doing that is to scroll down and we can look at what workflows and what hosts and what user this happened for. So in this case, it's the host was a login host at UChicago and the user was agent three uh, and, um, and there's a path to the workflow that ran. So there's two workflows with integrity issues. One had 11 and one had 12. And this workflow is the same one that we talked about with the S3 issues uh, on an earlier slide. And so this is, this is we, are, we know that this is an ongoing issue with the S3 transfers here. We think that it's probably a bug in, in um, the S3 server that we're using, which is, which is the CephFS uh, S3 server or maybe a, a server client um, uh, interaction problem. But, but it happens regularly enough that we see them in the, these graphs. Uh, it's not a concern because these workflows do retry and they, they, they do work on the retries. So this is one of the examples where we just, um, you know, leaving this alone because at the end of the day, it doesn't really affect the user. But it's an interesting, um, um, you know, interesting to see this keep on happening in production workflows. So I just want to see, show you how, how this data looks to us. Uh, any questions about, about this? Uh, while people are typing, I'm just gonna go ahead and grab the screen back real quick here. Yep. Uh, because I wanna go over a couple of news items related to trusted CI. So, um, thanks. Uh, Again, Mats and Anurban for presenting. Um, those of you who are attending, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking our survey uh, and giving us some feedback about this presentation. And uh, we also have a comments field for suggestions of new topics. So please uh, take a moment to let us know what you thought of this presentation. And then um, uh, this is kind of a very brief uh, announcement. Uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. I, uh, yep. Uh, we have a uh, presentation tomorrow. Um, this is part of our regular fellows uh, project that we launched earlier this year. Uh, this is a one-time only public presentation. Um, it's going to be tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Our presenter is Victoria Stodden. She's an associate professor at Stanford Law School. And her topic is going to cover data reproducibility. And as far as I understand, the presentation will have a sort of open format. So if, if you are interested in data reproducibility, which some of you who are watching this presentation probably are, uh, if, go ahead and, and pre, uh, attend this, this uh, presentation and bring your questions. Uh, it's not easy to share links here on Zoom. So I posted a link to our homepage. If you go to trustedci.org, you'll see uh, a little calendar of events and you'll see an event for the 27th with a link there. So please go ahead and uh, join the meeting if, you, if you're available. And a reminder to register for the Cybersecurity Summit. Our Trusted CI NSF Summit is going to be held October 15th through 17th in San Diego. The call for presentations just closed. We are reviewing the proposals. It's a very good year. We got more than uh, the previous year. So we're excited to select the, 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 uh, the proposals and present them to the public. Uh, so don't forget to register. Find us at trustedci.org slash summit. And then next month, our webinar is going to be on Jupiter security at Livermore Labs. And our presenter is Thomas Mendoza. So please join us and uh, be on the lookout for announcements about that. Any questions that people want to give us while well, we've got a couple more minutes. I don't want to keep you too long over the hour if you've got a meeting to go to. I'm just going to let people have a moment to uh, let us know if they've got a question. Um, and with that, I think we will uh, wrap things up. Thank you very much, Mats and Anurban, for presenting this month. And uh, did you have any final comments that you wanted to share with the audience? 
No, thank you for having us and uh, you know, feel free to, to contact us if there's any additional questions. Yes, thanks for the opportunity and hope to hear from some of you. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. All right, well, uh, oh, we got someone says, really interesting presentation, thanks. Well, thank you for that feedback. Uh, I'll go ahead and stop recording.